It would be around 11 o'clock at night on Christmas Eve. My parents were not at home and would not be back until the next day, as they were partying at my grandparents' house. Under normal circumstances, it would have been, I would have gone, but I was sick. So there I was, alone in my house, with a fever of 37 and a half, watching TV when suddenly my doorbell rang. I went to see who it was. I wasn't expecting any visitors, and I knew it, would, it couldn't be my parents, since my grandparents' town is an hour and a half away from where we live. And they had called me to let me know that they had arrived only a quarter of an hour ago. I looked through the peephole to see who it was, but no one was there. I assumed it was a drunken joker. You know, on Christmas Eve night, I opened the door to make him leave. But when I did, I found a package on the landing. Wow, it seemed that Santa Claus had come this early this year. I don't know who would have bitten, but at that time, he seemed like a pretty generous person. However, to my misfortune, my disappointment was not long in coming. I took the package home and opened it. Inside was an envelope on which was written, Keep it. I don't want it anymore. Along with a copy of Pokemon Silver Edition, the original. I thought that was, a, that was great at the time, as I had fond memories of that game, and mine had run out of battery power, making it impossible to save the game. I grabbed my old Game Boy Advance SP and began my Yada. However, first I opened the envelope to see what was inside and found a note with instructions to follow. Still to this day, I keep it along with the game and it says, Hello, if you're reading this, it is because you have my game. And since I have given it to you, I ask you to please continue it up to the point I tell you in this letter. Then you can play freely. Well, since you gave it to me, but what less can I do for you? I read on. First, don't start a new game. Continue mine already saved. I have captured the three legendary dogs. And I've given the GS ball to Caesar. So as soon as you go talk to him, you can capture Celebi. I have captured 248 Pokemon besides Celebi. I'm missing Lucia and Ho-Ho. Please capture them and complete the Pokedex. Damn. What luck. He had practically handed it all to me on a golden platter. I was really looking forward to completing the Pokedex, so I got on with it. I continued a game that had already been started by its former owner and started checking its data. The trainer's name was S-U-S-E-J, a bit odd for a trainer's name, but I'll tell you but I'll tell what it means later if you can figure it out for yourselves. My team consisted of a Houndoom, a Lapras, and a Slowbro, at levels 36, 32, and 63 respectively, and a Sandshrew, an Abra, and a Pidgey at very low levels, which I probably had used them to mo use them which I probably had them to use the MOs. I had all 16 medals and the money limit. Playing time 662.50 uh, or thereabouts. That made me think of the previous owner was a Hitaitiete. And the Poke Gear right about 11.50 p.m. on Saturday. The same time and day of the week as the one I was playing on. At the time, that just seemed like a coincidence to me. Once I knew my data, I s started playing. First, I captured Celebi, since I was in Azalea Village right at the start, and it was the closest one to me. I did the whole process. I talked to Caesar. I received the GS ball. Then I went to Inkensiar. I deposited it into him. Monuments to the Guardian of the Force, and the battle with Selby began. I was very excited to capture him, since without a special event, you can't get him. I caught him after a while, when I got tired of throwing normal Pokeballs at him, and threw a Master Ball out of three I had, and I got a message saying that he had been transferred to Bill's PC to Pandora's box. 
Pandora's box? I figured it was a joke. For those who don't know, Pandora's box is a myth. I think Greek, which says that if it's if it is opened, demons will come out of it. Things like that. Then the human race will be doomed. Without giving it too much importance. Since the name of the boxes would be could be changed. I continued and captured the other two legendaries I had left. It was easy as I said before. I had the necessary master balls. Once I had captured all the legendaries and thus completed the Pokedex, I continued reading the instructions given to me by the former owner. 2. Now that you have captured all legendaries, create the following team. Mew, Celebi, Ho-Ho, Ho-Oh, Lugia, Suicune, and Moltres. Wait for the Pokegear to mark 3 o'clock a.m. to perform the next step. So it was 1 o'clock a.m. in the game, and since it marked the same time it actually was, I had to stay awake until 3 as well. I didn't mind. I was having a good time playing that game. I went to talk to Professor Oak to see what he would tell me about the Pokedex. Went to Zoluna City to get the diploma certifying that I had completed the Pokedex. Defeated Red and took a look at the other boxes. The guy had even caught the four missing nose. It kept fooling around like that until I realized that it was already 2.45 a.m. I read the next step. Third, when it is 3 o'clock a.m., go to the Alpha Ruins. Enter the main chamber and go to the last statue following the corridor down. In front of it, put the unknown radio signal and talk to it. So I did. I went, went pulling towards the Alpha Ruins. I took the Magnet Train because I was in Kanto and from Triangle City to my destination I walked. I had plenty of time. When I, when I finally arrived it, it was 2.58 a.m. So I waited for two minutes in front of the statue from the, with the unknown radio signal on. The noise was making me quite nervous. When the Pokemon gear finally read 3 o'clock a.m., I spoke to the statue. It admitted the cry for Pokemon, but it didn't sound like one I knew. The text boxes started popping up. Mew is gone. And Mew's cry. Celebi is no more, and her scream, and so on, until the na they named all the Pokemon on my team. At the end, another text box came up. Your team's sacrifice was allowed the release of the Unknown King. When I closed the text box, the screen went black for about two seconds, and then popped up on the King Unknown's page in the Pokedex, which went something like this. This ferocious beast can sleep for centuries, and when it wakes, it will kill anything for food. It had no number, and its cry was one that had sounded before. It was dark blue like unknown, but its form only resembled them in the head, where it had three spikes, like a crown, and it had only one eye. Unlike the unknown, this one had a body, legs and arm ending in spikes stained red. I guess it could be for blood. Could be blood. When I closed the Pokedex, I appeared back where I had found an unknown king, and another message popped up saying, You have released the beast. When I closed it, the game automatically saved. I then had exactly 666 hours of gameplay. I looked at the equipment, but n now I had no Pokemon. The game started to get on my nerves. I left the chamber and headed to Maw of City to pick up some Pokemon from the PC. During the dive to said city, I noticed that there, there was something strange. Plus the music from the unknown radio single, signal kept playing everywhere I went. But I only noticed it as soon as I entered the Pokemon Center. There were no people. The NPCs had disappeared. When I looked inside the PC, I found out of the 20 practically full boxes, there are now only two Pokemon Pandora's box, level 20 Staryu in a, in a Shanshu from before. I didn't know what was going on, so I was wandering all over Jonto. There are no NPCs in any town, no route, not even the houses. I read the next step of the note. Fourth, 
wait for the call. The call from whom? I don't know who was supposed to call me, so I opened a Poke Gear and looked at the numbers. Only Professor M's and or Oro's mother were there. I called Professor M, but a message popped up saying he doesn't seem to be answering. When I called Oro's mother, I got the usual text. It was already 3.30 a.m. and still no one had called me back. I had already kicked all, almost all of Jonto, and there wasn't a single person, and there, was, and there were no Pokemon in the grass either. Finally, the call came. It was from Oro's mother. It said, Son, please come home quickly. The cry of the Unknown King sounded, and the call ended. Between the fever and the sleep, sleepiness, I started to feel sick. But I wanted to know what was going on, and now I knew where to go. In my house, there was no one. However, upstairs there seemed to be a note on the wall, and it's, I read it, and it said, Fifth and last, go see Professor Oak. Before I left, I looked at the houses in Springtown to see if anyone was there. However, I already feared there were no one. Not one NPC in all of Jonto. Now I knew I had to go to Kanto. And since I couldn't take either the SSN or the Magneto train, then I understood why I just had those two Pokemon. So I could go surfing all the way to Kanto. However, before going to see Professor Oak, I took a walk around Kanto to see if anyone was there. There only seemed to be Mr. Fuji in Lavender Town. I talked to him and he said, I've been very busy lately. That's when I understood what was going on. The Unknown King had killed every person and Pokemon in the game. Hence what his Pokemon page said. After talking to the possibility, the last person in the game, I went to Pallet Town. I had no flight, but there were no Pokemon in the grass or water either. So it didn't take me long to get there. There was no one I there either. Neither in Red's house, nor in Blue's house. I entered Professor Oak's laboratory, as expected. There was not even a person NPC, but where Professor Oak normally stands, there was a mini sprite of an unknown. I guess what I had to do, so I stood in front of it and pressed A. The cry of the unknown king sounded, and the battle against it began. He was level 100, and to top it off, equipped with several restore everything. He finished off my Pokemon in no time, but as soon as the last of my Pokemon was weakened, the battle continued. Gold was at level 10. I already knew I was not going to be able to do anything against that critter. I thought about turning off the console, but then I thought better of it. I told myself that if I didn't see how it ended, I would be intrigued because maybe this wouldn't happen to me again. After all, it was a game. What could happen to me? Oro knew the cliche, but he didn't get used to it because the Unknown King tech first. He used Bite and Oro was weakened. Messers came out saying, S-U-S-E-J is dead. The screen went black for a few seconds, then a sprite of a man dressed in black appeared. As Professor Oak appears at the beginning of the game, he said the following to me, S-U-S-E-J, -E you just released a beast and doomed the human race. I couldn't have done it without you. Then the screen went black, and after a minute, the normal intro of the game started with Lugia flying in the blue sky. There was no previous save game. I could only start a new one. It was already 4.30 a.m., so I turned off the console and tried to sleep since. Besides being sick, I felt very tired. That night, I dreamed that I was king unknown, and I was wandering around the world, looking for my next victim. I don't know if this was a morbid joke or if it really had a supernatural origin. What I do know is that I was a month without stopping to think about it, and that every time I remembered it, my hair stands on end, and I even have nightmares about it from time to time. If it was a joke, which I hope it is, I think it was a joke of a Satanist or something. 3.30 a.m. is considered Satan's hour, which is coincided with the 666 hours of gameplay. 
S-U-S-E-J is Jesus in reverse. Not to mention the release of the beast. Of one thing I am sure, having played that game, has left me scarred for life. I stumbled on this unsettling story of an obscure Pokemon bootleg that I thought might be the need to share on here. I think this originated from 4chan, so I have no idea if this hack actually exists. It probably doesn't, but it's still a great concept. I'm what you call a, a collector of bootleg Pokemon games. Pokemon Diamond and Jade, Chaos Black, etc. It's amazing the frequency which with you can find them at pawn shops, Goodwill, flea markets, and such. They're generally fun, even if they are unplayable. And mistranslations and poor quality make them unintentionally humorous. I've been able to find most of the ones I've played online, but there's one that I haven't seen any mention of. I bought it at a flea market with about a five years ago. Here's a picture of the cartridge, in case anyone recognizes it. Unfortunately, when I moved two years ago, I lost the game, so I can't provide you with screen caps. Sorry. The game started with a with the familiar Nidorino and Gengar intro of red and blue version. However, the press start screen had been altered. Red was there, but the Pokemon did not cycle through. It also said black version under the Pokemon logo. Upon selecting new game, the game started with Professor Oak's speech, and it quickly became evident that the game was essentially Pokemon red version. After selecting your starter, if you looked at your Pokemon, you had an addition to Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle, and another Pokemon, Ghost. The Pokemon was level 1. It had a sprite of the ghosts that are encountered in Lavender Town before obtaining the self scope. It had one attack, Curse. I know that there, there, was a, there is a real move named Curse, but the attack did not exist in Generation 1, so it appears it was hacked in. Defending Pokemon were unable to attack Ghost. It would only say they were too scared to move. When the move curse was used in battle, the screen would cut to black. The cry of defending Pokemon would be heard, but it was distorted. Played at much lower pitch than normal, the battle screen would then reappear and the defending Pokemon would be gone. If used in a battle against a trainer, when the Pokeballs were presenting their Pokemon would appear in the corner, they would have one fewer Pokeball. The implication was that the Pokemon died. What's even sh stranger is that after defeating a trainer and seeing Red receive $200 for winning, the battle com commands would appear again. If you selected Run, the battle would end as it normally does. You could also select Curse. If you did, upon returning to the overworld, the trainer sprite would be gone. After leaving and re-entering the area, the spot where a trainer had been would be replaced with a tombstone, like the ones at Lavender Town. Move Curse was not usable in all instances. It would fail against ghost Pokemon. It would also fail if it was used against trainers that you, had, you would have to face again, such as your rival or Giovanni. It was usable in your final battle against them, however. I figured this was the gimmick of the game, allowing you to use previously cap uncaptured ghosts. And because Curse made the game so easy, I essentially used it throughout the whole adventure. The game changed quite a bit after defeating the Elite Four. After viewing the Hall of Fame, which consisted of ghosts and a couple of very underleveled Pokemon, the screen cut to black. The box appeared with the, t with the words many years later. It then cut to Lavender Town. A, an old man was standing, looking at tombstones. You then realize this man was your character. The man moved at only half of your normal walking speed. 
you no longer had any Pokemon with you, not even Ghost, who up to this point had been impossible to remove from your party through depositing it in the PC. The hole was entirely empty. There are no people at all. There are still tombstones of the trainers that you used cursed on. However, you could go pretty much anywhere in overall at this point, though your movement was limited by the fact that you had no Pokemon to use HMs. And regardless of where you went, the music of Lavender Town continued on an infinite loop. After wandering for a while, I found that if you go through the Digwitz Cave, one of the cuttable bushes that no longer blocks the path on the other side is no longer there, allowing you to advance and return to Pallet Town. Upon entering your house and going to the exact tile where you start the game, the screen would cut to black. Then a spread of a caterpie appeared. It was replaced by a Weedle and then a Pidgey. I soon realized as the Pokemon progressed from Rattata to Blastoise that these were all of the Pokemon that I had used Cursed on. After the end of my rival's team, a youngster appeared, then a bug catcher. These were the trainers I had cursed. Throughout the sequence of the Lavender's Town music was playing, but it was slowly decreasing in pitch. By the time your rival appeared on screen, it was little more than a demonic's rumble. After a cut to black, a few moments later, the battle screen suddenly appeared. Your trainer sprite was now that of an old man, the same as the one who teaches you how to catch Pokemon in Viridian City. Ghost appeared on the other side, along with the words, Ghost wants to fight. You couldn't use items, you had no Pokemon. If you tried to run, you couldn't escape. The only option was fight. Using fight would immediately cause you to use struggle, which didn't affect Ghost, but it did chip a bit of your own HP. When it was Ghost's turn to attack, it would simply say nothing. Eventually, when your HP reached a critical point, Ghost would finally use Curse. The screen cut to black a final time. Regardless of the buttons you pressed, you were apparently stuck in this black screen. At this point, the only thing you could do was turn the Game Boy off. When you played again, new game was the only option. The game had erased the file. I played through this hack game many, many times, and every time the game ended with a sequence. Several times I didn't use Ghost at all, though he was impossible to remove from the party. In these cases, it did not show any Pokemon or trainers and simply cut to climatic battle with Ghost. I'm not sure what the motives were behind the creator of this hack. It wasn't widely distributed, so it was presumably not for monetary gain. It was very well done for a bootleg. It seems he was trying to convey a message, though it seems I am the sole receiver of this message. I am not entirely sure what it was. The ability of death? Pointlessness of, of it? Perhaps he was simply trying to morbidly inject death and darkness into a children's game? Regardless, this children's game has made me think, and it has made me cry. I must have been six or seven when I lived in Lebanon. The country was ravaged by war at the time, and murders were common and frequent. I remember during a particular vicious era, when the bombings rarely stopped, I would stay at home, sitting in front of my television, watching a very, very strange show. It was a kid's show that lasted about 30 minutes. It contained strange and sinister images. To this day, I believe it was a thinly veiled attempt on the, the part of the media to use scare tactics to keep kids in place, because the moral of every episode revolved around very uptight ideologies, stuff like bad kids stay up late, bad kids have their hands under the covers when they sleep, and bad kids steal food from the fridge at night. It was very weird, and in, in an Arabic to top it off, I didn't understand much of it, but for the most part, the images were very graphic and comprehensive. The thing that stuck with me the most, however, was the closing scene. It remained much the same in every episode. 
the camera would zoom in on an old, rusted, closed door. As it got closer to the door, strange and sometimes even agonizing screams would become more audible. It was extremely frightening, especially for children's programming. Then a text would appear on the screen in Arabic reading. That's where the bad kids go. Eventually, both the image and the sound would fade out. And that would be the end of the episode. About 15 or 16 years later, I became a journalistic photographer. That, sh that show had been in my mind all my life, popping up in my thoughts sporadically. Eventually, I had enough and decided to do some research. I finally managed to uncover the location of the studio where much of that channel's programming had been recorded. Upon further research and eventually traveling on site, I had found out it was now desolate and had been abandoned after the big war ended. I entered a building with my camera. It was burnt out from the inside. Either a fire had broken out or someone had wanted to incinerate all the wooden furniture. After a few hours of cautiously making my way into the studio and snapping pictures, I found an isolated, out-of-the-way room. After having to break through a few old locks and managing to break the heavy door open, I remained frozen in the doorway for several long mi minutes. Traces of blood, feces, and tiny bone fragments lay scattered across the floor. It was, it was a small room and an extremely morbid scene. What truly frightened me, though, which made me turn away and never want to come back, was the bolted, caged microphone hanging from the roof in the middle of the room. A coward has many guises, and my bluff has been called. I'm not a brave man. I slept with a nightlight on until I was in my 20s. Yet here I am, Mr. Tough Guy, first line of defense against forces unknown. Forces that were unknown until we went poking around in the dark, looking for them. The warning signs were all there. All I had to do was accept them. Now look at where I am. So our situation's a mess. Everything is out of hand. And it's all my fault. Now the only way forward, forward is with uncertainty, fear, and trepidation. I should have pulled the plug on operations. There was more than enough conclusive data to suggest possible containment failure. But no, I just had to go and poke the preferable bear with the quantum stick. What could go wrong, I thought. I've always known certain inherent dangers came with the job. But I was in charge of local containment. I rarely ever got to see a subject in its natural habitat. I spent most of my time in the lab, so I jumped on the opportunity to assist in live capture. Funds were sparse. They always were. That's the thing about clandestine operations. It's hard to fund something that doesn't exist, so I was our only available containment expert. It was my job to a certain and evaluation of success. On my initial assessment, I concluded we were understaffed and underfunded. But I purposefully overlooked some minor details and issued a passing score. It was a class two assignment, a simple grab the and bag job. Myself, Agent Claveres, and the youngest rookie I've ever met, Agent Thompson pulled up in a work van dressed in gas company uniforms. The bag had occurred in the basement of an old two-story house. I was so excited I forgot to unbuckle my seatbelt before I stepped out of the van. I felt a strap bite into my shoulder as I lurched forward. Shit, I said. This isn't the, the time to be clumsy. Grumbled Agent Alvarez as he crossed himself and slid out of the driver's seat. 
I didn't know you were rebellious. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't know you were re religious. I said, unbuckling and sliding out of my seat. Agent Clark Ferris walked around the van and opened the side door. Only on the job, he responded. The rookie hopped out of the back and scanned the surrounding darkness. When will our backup arrive? He asked. You're looking at it, Agent Calveras grunted. Why would we need a backup for a Class 2? I asked. I thought Class 2s were easy. Oh, sorry. There's nothing easy about what we do, kid, said Agent Calveras as he strolled up the sidewalk to the house, pausing to open the gate. After you. He said, waving me through the opening. For the first time since I had accepted the assignment, I was rethinking my initial excitement. In my job, I find a subject's weaknesses and teach others how to exploit them. Somehow, I had forgotten how much damage she th these things can do, the extent of which I have yet to see for myself. Sure, I've dealt with plenty of Class II subjects in the lab, usually heavily sedated and in a secure cage, but I've never been near an anomalous subject without arduously strict guidelines and fail-safes in order. In the field, anything can happen, and I was standing at the threshold of uncertainty with nothing between myself and madness but a cherry red door ready to be opened, like a new chapter and life eager to write itself into existence. It beckoned me, hurling me toward the danger, pointing toward the darker depths of truth. A.J. Calveras turned the knob and pushed the door open. There was no turning back. We stood for a moment, staring into the dark entryway. At my request, we had, his, had the power shut off which increased the safety of operations by 2%. Only a fool would have left it on. It was weird how normal it looked. Just a house, clean and orderly, with a fresh pine scent emanating from within. As I stepped across the threshold, my hair stood on end, and a tingling sensation crawled across my skin, sending a shiver down my spine. That Bet you've never felt that before, have you, Doc? Ancient Bumpson grinned, leading away to the back of the house. I'll never get used to it, Agent Calvera said as he removed the stun gun from his, well, under his jacket. Temporal displacement, I said. Temporal this what now? asked Agent Thompson, removing a small device from his pocket. It's what responsible for the goose pimples, if you will, I responded. As soon as we get finished here, I'm writing a book about it, said Agent Thompson. Sure thing, Shakespeare, I said. Are you getting smart with me, Doc? Ex Agent Thompson, turning to face me, his eyes narrowing to two beady slits. I hadn't realized how imposing he was. He had a grizzle of masculinity that, until that moment, I hadn't noticed. For that matter, I have never even heard of the guy before we left Ark. I didn't mean anything by it, I said. I'm sure you didn't, he responded, clapping me on the shoulder. We had made our way through the house to the kitchen. To the back of the room was the door to the basement. I could hear my pulse beating in my ears, my resolve melting away more and more with each step, depending on what species subject came through the anomaly. It may be able to hear my racing heart. Perhaps it can sense our pheromones and knows we are closing in for a capture. Calm down, Doc. It's only a class two, right? 
choked Agent Calveras as he readied himself to open the door. He crossed himself once more, turned the knob to another unknown destination. The door opened into the kitchen, exposing a flight of stairs that plunged into the darkness below. The rookie pulled a flashlight from his belt and turned it on, covering it with his fingers to dim the light. As the rookie passed his light over to me, he paused. Where's the fucking cage? Sorry. Where's the fucking cage? He asked. Agent Calveras turned in front of the stairs to face me. What kind of containment expert are you? He snapped at me. I I forgot it. I, I've never been in the field before. I stammered. There was a sound in the basement. An icy whistle rose from the darkness. I heard Yeah, Alright, there we go. I restarted stream. I'm going to read back to where... I'm going to go up a bit. Because I don't know where it went. But it stopped at. So I'm going to start right here. Hopefully, it didn't get rid of too much. Sorry to everyone. <laughs> Sorry everyone about that. I don't know why it disconnected. Yeah. yeah. Depending on what species subject came through the anom anomaly, it may be able to hear my racing heart. Racing and sense our pheromones and know knows we are closing in for the capture. Calm down, Doc. It's only a class two, right? Choked Agent Calveras as he readied himself to open the door. He crossed himself once more and turned the knob to another unknown destination. The door pulled open into the kitchen, exposing a flight of stairs that plunged into the darkness below. The rookie pulled a flashlight from his belt and turned it on, covering it with his fingers to dim the light. As the rookie passed the flashlight over to me, he paused. Where's the fucking cage? He asked. Agent Calveras turned in front of the stairs to face me. What kind of containment expert are you? He snapped at me. I, I forgot. I, I've never been in a field before. I stammered. There was a sound from the basement. An icy whistle rose from the darkness. I heard the stairs creak, and before Agent Thompson could get this flashlight fixed on the ground, on the sound, a lightning fast streak lunged up the stairs and struck Agent Calveras in the chest. Agent Calveras flew across the kitchen, slamming into the stove. He clutched at the creature, managing to throw it off into the pots and pans hanging above his head. The creature was back on him before the first pan hit the ground. Get it off! Yelled Agent Calveras. Contain! Contain! I was frozen. I couldn't move. I could see blood forming on Agent Calveras' chest and arms. Such appeared to be a Class II scripper. They're not very big, but they make up for it with thick skin and razor sharp everything and ferocity. It was all Agent Calveras could do to keep it at bay. Contain! He kept shouting as the skipper lashed and lunged and gnawed at his arms and chest. Agent Calveras fell to the floor, grabbed the oven door, opening it as he fell, seizing the opportunity. I hunted the skip scripper into the oven and slammed it shut, pressing it against it to keep it closed. Took you long enough, Agent Calveras grunted, rising to his feet. His chest and arms looked shredded, even in the dark. Scripper thrashed around in the oven so hard I struggled to keep it shut. Agent Calveras grabbed the chair and slid it under the handle. Once I was confident the door was going to hold, I stood. Where's the kid? Agent Calveras asked. In all the commotion, I didn't notice he was missing. The door to the basement door stood open. 
There was a soft glow of light in the basement, just enough for the bo to see the bottom of the stairs. Algin Caveras approached the stairwell. Agent Thompson. Agent Thompson? He called down the stairs before turning to me. Find the stun gun, he said. Started down the stairs. Do you think there's more of them? I asked when I searched the kitchen for the stun gun. It, it doesn't seem likely there's two, does it? Not likely, but not impossible either. Agent Calveras responded before continuing. For our sake, let's hope it's another scripper, not something else. I found the stun gun underneath a counter on the far side of the kitchen. These aren't your garden variety stun guns. They aren't electric. Instead, they rely on a focus frequency unique to the anomaly. For some reason, electricity seemed to feed most anomalous beings. Imagine your favorite zoo animal oh, popped up on metaphetamines, and then you then teach it on how to use a gun, and it would still be less dangerous. I clutched the gun in my hand. I felt ridiculous holding it. It wasn't part of my training. I wasn't even authorized to use it. Nevertheless, I went to the stairs in time to see Agent Calveras turn the corner into the basement, and I started my descent. When I reached the landing, Agent Calveras stood in the middle of the basement holding the rookie's flashlight. I stopped in my tracks as I saw what I was looking at. Agent Thompson stood in front of an open anomaly I had never seen from before. It was as if someone had unzipped a tent flap to another world. He turned to look at us, and even as he did, his face morphed and contorted into countless shapes, his grin ever present among them. I raised the gun as at what was once Agent Thompson. He raised his arms at his sides and started to levitate. He was at least a foot off the ground. What are you doing? Shoot! Agent Calvera shouted. The imposter before us started to laugh, his face an, an ever-changing, convulted mess. The basement shook, and, and for all I knew, the whole world was quaking. I felt defenseless. I couldn't think. Let alone move. A shadow loomed over the other side of the anomaly, and a voice spoke from somewhere amongst the ever-changing portions of Agent Thompson's face. You shall live for now. For it was you amongst my enemies foolish enough to release me. Before I could pull the trigger, a giant tentacle tore through the anomaly and pulled whatever he was through. There was a sickening pop as the anomaly seemed to implode upon itself, folding smaller and smaller until there was nothing but myself and Agent Calveras in the basement. You don't see that often, Agent Calveras turned to the stairs. That's it? Rexley screamed. That's your takeaway? Yeah, I did my job. The anomaly's closed, said an ancient Calvera, struggling as he climbed the stairs. We have to at least talk about what we just saw, I snapped, following him up the stairs. I believe you have a job to finish, Agent Calvera said as he stepped into the kitchen, motioning to the oven. The door to the oven stood open. The chair that held it was shut with some splinters, and heard a familiar whistle from somewhere in the house. I'll be in the van. Agent Calvera smirked as he made his way toward the front house. What? You can't be leave alone with that thing? I fumed. You can't be serious! He said to yourself, Doc. It's only a class two. How serious can it get? That's not fair. Jimmy cried, slamming his large gray Nintendo DS shut. You cheat! I told you never to use your blast toys. His number was too high. Preston smirked through Jimmy's voice, made him glance at the metallic picnic table across the playground, where Miss Hilton sat reading some book. I really don't want to see her take my game away again, he thought. He closed a smaller blue DS so that the float Pokemon sticker showed on the front and tucked it between his legs, just in case she looked up. No one likes you, Pokemon freak! Jimmy said. His limbs shook, and his face turned red. 
for a moment, Preston thought Jimmy looked like a red version of the Hulk. He felt a smile coming on, but forced it back. Any more attention will alert Miss Hilton. Miss Hilton. Jimmy just stood over him, fist clenched, but finally just walked away. Preston sighed, tucking his game system in his pocket. Kids played sharp in the sandbox and swung one another on swings. Preston sighed, staring at them, but then turned away. He had a lot of friends, after all. Pokemon. So he brushed dirt off his po Pokemon shirt with Ash and Pikachu. So he brushed dirt, dirt off his Pokemon shirt with Ash and Pikachu and sat under the tree near the forest on the darkest outskirts of the playground. Acorn's head in the golden orange leaf blurred the ground as and as Pat Preston sat, his back scraped against the tree's trunk. The boy cast another glance at his teacher before he took the DS out of his shorts pocket. He opened it and pressed the power button, but stopped when he caught something out of corner of his eye. At first glance it looked like a yellow speck. Though the more Preston looked at it, the more it looked like a... A hypno? Preston blinked, expecting an image to be gone, but there it sat, swinging its pendulum, a gray stone, with a hollow center attached to a string, to and fro. Its cat-like ears perked up, and a long nose was nestled between two squinted eyes. Oh, Preston said, placing his DS on the ground, slowly getting up. And hypno sat as it was watching its pendulum go back and forth. Preston crept toward it, making sure that his foot rose high enough and fall, fell gently as to not make a sound. Whenever the Pokemon glanced in Preston's direction, he darted behind a tree. They are real. I knew it. If only I had a Pokeball. The closer the boy got, the more he noticed some things about Hypno. The first was that the Pokemon's face looked rough and paper-like, almost as though it was made of what was its M's. But what, what was Miss Hilton helped us make our Halloween ma mask out of? Paper mache. And its eyes were more set back, as though Hypno wore a mask. His skin looked more like a yellow long sleeve shirt and pants. But he wore no shoes. He, he kind of looks like Hypno, Preston thought, but no more had he thought than he realized that everything looked different in a cartoon than reality, like how Tom and Jerry looked goofier than a regular cat and mouse. Preston felt a foot fell on a twig. A piece of wood broke and a resounding snap. Pokemon looked up at the boy, its pendulum coming to a halt. Preston froze. A breeze seemed to carry the sounds of the other children off, so it seemed that only the boy and the Pokemon remained. He expected the Hypno to run, but all it did was tilt its head to the side. Come, little child. Come with me. Safe and happy you will be. The Pokemon sang, though its squeaky voice, hardly higher than a whisper. Preston's eyes widened. You can talk? The boy said. You don't even move your mouth. I am a psychic type Pokemon, Hypno said. I don't need to speak to talk. With that, he raised a hand and poked his head. Oh, Preston said. Away from home, now let us run, the Hypno sang once more, extending a hand. With Hypno, you'll have so much fun. Preston smiled, taking a step forward. Finally, he had a real live Pokemon. He could live with Hypno and help train him. Maybe I, I can even catch more Pokemon with Hypno's help. Preston! Hypno's eyes narrowed with deep eye holes. Miss Henson had her eyes round, had her hands around her mouth, calling for the boy. Preston raised a hand and turned to follow the other kids back to primary school. When he glanced back, Hypno was gone.
Preston grabbed his DS and rushed back to class with his classmates, though his thoughts remained on the playground. When the class moved on with the day, taking turns during activities like drawing or playing math games, Preston snuck over to the window and stared off into the woods. There was nothing but the spring trees. Dumb Miss, Miss Henson, the boy thought. He scared Hypno away. The thought made his eyes water, but he forced them back. He wouldn't cry. Preston blinked a few times, though, when he opened his eyes again and focused them. Just at the edge of the trees, he noticed Hypno standing with a slight stoop, swinging his pendulum back and forth. You are f such a fucking idiot, Preston heard his mo mother through the bedroom walls. He turned up the volume on his game, laying on his bed and holding the console above his head. Why? Because I want, want to leave this place. His dad said. Preston placed his DS aside and glanced over at the clock on his bedside table. The clock in the grip of the plastic Pikachu said 10.34 and it glows in the dark numbers. Music blared from the game, though he still heard his parents as though they were in the same room. So you want him to take... So you want to take him away? The one place he's grown up in? You want to take him away from that? He's... He's only eight years old, for fuck's sake. Preston rolled off his Pokemon bedspread, allowing his eyes to adjust after playing his Pokemon game for close to three hours straight. Pokemon posters covered the whole walls. The one thing that separated them were sliver, slivers of light blue wall. He thought of putting in a movie. Maybe that could be louder than the fighting, but then again, he was supposed to be sleeping. Maybe he could draw, but he would need light. Play with his action figures, maybe too much noise, and needed light. So he just sighed, hopped back to bed, and took himself back to bed, into bed. Preston had held the DS back over his head, the light of the game allowing him to see the cuffs of his fleece Pokemon pajamas. Tomorrow will be better, he thought. It's Halloween, and a field trip to the caves. A smile crawled across his lips. Then he noticed about his game was the only noise he heard. His tense little body relaxed as though on cue his eyes. He felt his eyelids get heavy. Preston moved his head hand to turn off the DS but stopped. He put his game on pause, then opened up his Pokedex. The, co the compendium of all the monsters he had caught in the game. He scrolled down the long list until the curtain cursor highlighted Pokemon number 96. A hypno appeared on the sh screen with its yellow skin, squinty eyes, and pendulum. Preston read the description. It carries a pendulum-like device. There once was an incident in which it took a away a child it, it hypnotized. I wish I could take- you would take me away, Preston said. He turned off his game, placed it on his bedside table and close his eyes. All right, everyone, Miss Hilton said. Be careful. These caves can be very dangerous, so stay behind me and watch where you walk. Preston took to the end of the line of children, looking around at the towering pines behind him. Pines around him. The golden light of autumn shined through the leaves, and the smell of grass and dirt filled them. They walked around a large hole in the ground, which they found as they pressed was a cave. They shot in from an opening at the bottom. The children craned their necks to see a gray stone a yard away. The ground sloped downhill as they reached the bottom. The cave mouth stood ready to welcome them. Miss Henson entered with the others following her. All of them craned their necks up to see the huge hole that they had just passed. Princeton smiled. He had expected the caves to be more like they were in his game. Ground, geometric, precise. Miss Hudson muttered something about noticing how they could see erosion where to rock down. Preston didn't listen. The doe just gazed up and around. 
gaze fell to the cave opening, he thought he saw a flash of yellow in the woods. Around midday, the class took out their lunches. Preston found a particularly leafy piece of ground and plopped down. He laid out a tin Pokemon lunchbox he had retrieved from the bus and opened it. Inside lay a peanut butter and jelly sandwich stuffed into a baggie and a box of Minute Maid apple juice. He sighed. Why does Mom keep making the same lunch? Nevertheless, Preston grunted and picked up his plastic wrapped sandwich. Psst! Preston glanced around, looking for the one who pissed him. Everyone else paid him no mind. It couldn't have come from behind, thought there was nothing but woods behind him. Again, Preston sighed, probably just for someone else. He felt a knot tighten in his chest. Preston looked up, envying all the children who talked or played together. It was times like these that he wished he had his Pokemon game. Psst! Half behind a tree and a half hidden by the green shrubbery stood Hypno with his stooped posture and swinging his pendulum. Preston smiled and after making sure no one was watching him, edged toward the shrubbery. Hello, little child, Hypno said, cocking his head to the left like a bird. Hi, Hypno, Preston said, trying to keep his voice down. Why did you run away yesterday? I don't like adults seeing, Hypno said. Why? They don't like Pokemon. <laughs> Oh, Preston said, nodding his head. No wonder why Miss Henson was always trying to take away his Pokemon game. What's the name, little child? I'm Preston. Preston Michaels. Well, Preston, he said, I have something to show you. Hypno gestured behind him with his free hand, and then he turned and walked into the forest. Preston glanced back as usual. Everyone's attention was everywhere but him. He turned and followed his Pokemon into the foliage. The shrubbery clung to Preston's chain, making him stop every so often to wrench his legs from the thicket. Hypno walked ahead, his right arm always held out, swinging his pendulum. The smell of wet fruit made Preston's nose wrinkled every time he broke a large weed. Sweat formed on the bridge of his nose, and he kept having it wipe it away and push up his glasses. It only took five minutes of walking before two entered a tiny clearing. Hypno stopped in front of a hole in the ground, one like Preston had seen earlier that day, but smaller, perhaps only a meter in length and width. The boy glanced over his shoulder. He could just see the, the class and Miss Henson past the trees and foliage. Preston's shoulders slumped a little. No one's even missing me. The boy forced back a hiccup that seemed to be trying to force its way back up, and then turned to see Hypno still staring down. Preston glanced down into the hole. It looked deep. It Dark, the smell of wet earth, and something else drifted up from it. Preston wrinkled his nose. What is that place? But the boy asked. It's my home, Hypno said for the first time. Preston noticed that the Pokemon's voice seemed muffled. Why do you live in, in a place like that, Hypno? I have no owner, Hypno said. I have nowhere else to go. Me, me neither, Preston said, though his voice sounded small. There it was again, that lump in his chest. He wanted to be one of the, the kids the others played with. He wanted to be one of the kids whose parents never fought and paid attention to them. Tears slid down his cheeks. No one loves me. It no loves you. Hypno said, bending over to look Preston in the face. The boy could see every ridge 
in the Pokemon mask like face. Princess's lip quivered and he wrapped his arms around Hypno. I'm so lonely, Preston said, hugging the Pokemon tighter. Hypno shhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
His voice made the boy shiver even more. For you, your families will grieve. Minds unraveling at the seams, allowing me to hunt their dreams. Please, Preston said. Hypno stood. He swung his pendulum back and forth. But it seemed to shine in dim light. Each time it would hit the light, it made Preston squint. Hypno moved closer. Don't cry, Preston, Hypno said, squeaking in the same low, squeaky voice. Preston tried to crawl back. Blood ran down his arms and legs. Do not wail and do not weep. It's time for you to go to sleep. Hypno sang, his voice heightened as he sang, making Preston scream louder. Hypno's eyes widened, though only a bit of them was visible through the ice slits. Little chip, child, you're not clever. Now you'll stay with me forever. Hypno's lullaby. Come, little children, come with me. Safe and happy he will be. Always away from home, now let us run. With Hypno, he'll have so much fun. Oh, little children, please don't cry. Hypno wouldn't hurt a fly. Be free to frolic and be free to play. Come with me to my cave to stay. Oh, little children, please don't squirm. These ropes I know will hold you firm. Now look at me, the pinpoint calls. Back and forth, your eyelids fall. Oh, little children, you cannot leave. For you, your families will grieve. Minds unraveling at the scenes, allowing me to haunt their dreams. Do not wail and do not weep. It's time for you to go to sleep. Little children, you are not never. Now you will stay with me forever. <laughs>